promotional consideration paid for by the following. Hello and welcome once again, wrestling fans, Cheap Shot Entertainment. You are the Cheap Shot Nation, and I am your host, Luke. We are still navigating our way through the year 2022, and you're watching this 20 years after the pay per view known as Vengeance. July the 21st, 2002, in fact. And it was a dual branded pay-per-view uh, from Detroit, Michigan in the Joe Louis Arena in front of 12,000 fans on hand for this one. And uh, we watched this on the WWE Network. The theme song for this pay-per-view is Downfall by Trust Company. And the main event would be The Undertaker defending his championship, his undisputed championship versus... The Rock versus Kurt Angle. You can also find this arena in the video game Smackdown Here Comes the Pain. Raw, WWE Raw rather, 2 and WWE Smackdown Shut Your Mouth. So it's in two separate Smackdown games. And of course you can watch it on the network or on Peacock if you're joining us in America on... Uh, yeah, like I say, on the network, Vengeance 2002. Um, but before we get into the main video, I'm going to give you the Sunday Night Heat um, result because this is not featured on the network version. And it would be Goldust defeating Stephen Richards in the pre show. Anyway, with that being said, let's move on to the main part of the show. Hope you will join us there. In the meantime, click the subscribe button and like the video. Make sure you join us on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook. That's all the socials that you'll need from Cheap Shot Entertainment. And until that point, let's move into the main part of the video. I'll hope to see you there. So we get joined by Maggle Cole and Taz on commentary for this opening match. And uh, this is a tag team tables match where the winners, the winning team, need to put both of their opponents through tables individually. So the team is not eliminated after one person goes to the table. It has to be both participants in the tag team going through the table. Um, to win. Whilst this may not have been the best tag team match, tag team tables match uh, ever, it was certainly entertaining and what a way to open up a show. Um, you know, a tables match. And it featured Bubba Ray and Spike, the Dudley boys, uh, versus Eddie Guerrero and Chris Benoit. Um, so, yeah, the recently reformed Radicals group there... Um, going against the Dudley Boys, real classic sort of harking back to ECW days uh, with this one. Um, you know, the the Radical spent most of the match destroying Bubba Ray Dudley. Uh, Spike Dudley put Eddie Guerrero through a table to send him out of the, uh, uh, the match, leaving Chris Benoit on his own. And, uh, yeah, uh, Chris Benoit would take advantage of this with the table set up on the outside by the Dudley boys. And um, this uh, Chris Benoit would send Spike Dudley through the table next. He was hurled over the top rope um, into the prone table. Um, so... That would leave Benoit and uh, Bubba Ray Dudley uh, in, the, in the ring uh, over in the match. And uh, the table was set up uh, earlier in the match with a double suplex uh, missing completely. And um, yeah, Bubba Ray Dudley would 
eventually get the win with the Bubba bomb through a third table on Chris Benoit and he would win the match for his team. Um, so yeah, this was just hatred fueled uh, storyline really. There was no uh, gain to be made from this one and I suppose that really does dampen it a little bit but yeah, it was an entertaining opener. I'm going to give it three cheap shots out of five. And uh, yeah, really decent, decent opener. Anyway, we go backstage with the general manager of Raw, Eric Bischoff, giving an interview to Jonathan Coachman before getting distracted by the, distracted rather, by the arrival of Triple H. Of course, Triple H uh, being a free agent in the uh, draft at this point in time. Uh, Eric Bischoff attempting uh, Triple H to come to the Raw side as he walks into the um, SmackDown general manager's office. Uh, and uh, yeah, um, it, it would happen to be Stephanie McMahon, who is the estranged wife of the game, uh, who is... Uh, on the other side of that door, because um, trying to secure the services of their retrospective brands and Bischoff was none too happy that Hunter was on his way to negotiate with Stephanie. Um, we move on to the Cruiserweight Championship now, and uh, this one is between Cruiserweight Champion Jamie Noble picking up the championship at... Um, King of the Ring, I believe. Yes, he did. Um, and uh, he's going against former champion Billy Kidman. Of course, Nidia would be at ringside as well. Again, this match wasn't the greatest cruiserweight match that there ever was, and certainly not the best in 2002. But again, with Jamie Noble and Billy Kidman, in this one, both very talented performers. Billy Kidman, high-flying Jamie Noble, prefers the ground attack, not your traditional cruiserweight. And I absolutely adore the pairing of Jamie Noble and Nidia. Um, every time these two came on the screen during SmackDown program, I was absolutely, I was, I was hating them. Um, but, you know, appreciating what characters they put on screen which was fantastic um and it was um a bit of a storm at this one it you know it, it could have been a much longer it could have been given much longer there was no immediate interference from nidia um it's very much product of the time um but yeah there was some high flying here um like i say jamie noble making the best of his ground and pound attack and it would be J it would be jamie noble who picked up the victory from a mistake by billy kidman who missed the shooting star press and billy kidman was able to reverse a follow-up clothesline into a tiger bomb for the win and retaining his championship like i say this one is definitely uh, one that could have been loads, loads better, but in true uh, form for WWE, the first couple matches are pretty much on par with each other. I'm going to give this one three cheap shots out of five as well. Uh, again, perfectly good match. If given more time, could have been a show stealer. Going into backstage again, we get Kurt Angle being interviewed by Mark Lloyd and was interrupted by the arrival of Brock Lesnar and Paul Heyman. Heyman reminded Angle that Lesnar had a guaranteed title shot at SummerSlam after winning the King of the Ring, and as a result uh, would face the winner of Angle's match with The Rock and The Undertaker. Unperturbed, of course, the Olympic hero, woo, Kurt Angle, uh, promised Lesnar that when he when the two did meet, the next big thing would be taken down by the Olympic gold medalist. Because he won with a broken freaking neck. Again, 
really good stuff here in the backstage from Kurt Angle and from Lesnar and from Heyman uh, really building up a picture that makes you want to watch SummerSlam and it would be a really good SummerSlam as well. European Championship match. Can anybody remember the European Championship? I can. It was great. It's European Champion Jeff Hardy versus William Regal and just watching a, a Regal match is just pure gold. Um, he is not only a very good performer, his facial expressions are fantastic. Uh, possibly the best match on the card for what it was. And uh, saw both Champ and Challenger go back and forth in an entertaining, technically sound match. And you don't see that from Jeff Hardy very often, uh, but you do see that from William Regal. Uh, very good, albeit very short battle. The charismatic Enigma retained the gold uh, pinning William Regal, one, two, three. Again, three cheap shots out of five. And uh, like I say, probably the best match on the card at this point. Very close with um, <clears throat> the Cruiserweight Championship for me. Um, still European champion, Jeff Hardy. Post-match, Hardy was congratulated by both Ric Flair and Hulk Hogan, the future of TNA, the people that would take it down. Anyway, once uh, Jeff had left, Hogan told Flair that he was considering going to the top rope and doing a swanton bomb of his own in his match tonight. Of course, it's Hulk Hogan. Uh, this prompted Flair to mark Hogan, saying he'd be too slow climbing up to the top and would make a mess of the move. Great advice for someone who'd never hit a top rope move, ever. Um, the two legends uh, found it both funny uh, and about uh, nothing funny about Bischoff and Stephanie McMahon running the company uh, and uh, questioned whether Bischoff in particular would run WWE out of business. Of course, still got the bitterness about that, having the WWE at this point in time. Moving on now, rookie John Cena going against Chris Jericho, who would issue an open challenge, uh, and so it begins. This is the beginning, pretty much, of John Cena. And fun fact, Jericho was supposed to win this match, but refused to win the match because of you know, putting over the new talent and making John Cena the beast that he is today. Um, is one part of uh, the people who would put him over. Um, this was pay-per-view debut of one John Cena. Uh, the future legend had arrived on the scene a couple of weeks earlier, slapping the taste out of Kurt Angle and beating him uh, on SmackDown before entering into a feud with Chris Jericho. Uh, the two went tooth and nail in a match which was much better than the unenthusiastic crowd uh, would have you believe. So, yeah, uh, WWE crowds, WWF crowds have always had this problem with uh, someone coming in, being nice and shiny and clean and, and new and really energetic. Uh, they did it with The Rock as well, uh, thinking back. And, uh, yeah, really good match. Uh, good pace. Uh, John Cena and Jericho worked hard to deliver an entertaining performance, as you would expect from these two. Uh, before the rookie scored an upset first win on a pay-per-view. John Cena is your winner. I'm going to give this one 3.5 cheap shots out of five. Uh, really good match again. Um, so we're in the back again, and Eric Bischoff is accosted um, by Stephanie McMahon's lawyer, uh, who whom she said she had summoned to deliver some important documents. Uh, this gets Bischoff wondering what the documents are. Fearing that he was about to lose Triple H, Bish was livid. That's Bischoff, by the way. Uh, say what you want about Eric Bischoff. He always was very entertaining uh, and uh, great in front of the camera. Um, you know, he did what he needed to do for his boss to do his job in WCW, and he did that for 
as many weeks as you can remember. I think it's 83 weeks. I think that's the name of his podcast. So, yeah, 83 weeks. Very impressive. Very impressive indeed. Anyway, <clears throat> moving on. RVD versus Brock Lesnar. Um, ready for war. Um, <clears throat> as we moved into the second half of the show, Jim Ross and Jerry Lawler made their way out to take over from Cole and Taz. So the days before we had two sets of commentary teams out on the uh, ramps and stuff, uh, they would swap over halfway through and we get Jim Ross and Jerry Lawler taking over from Michael Cole and Taz. Uh, the first task was to show us clips of Brock Lesnar and Rob Van Dam preparing for their upcoming Intercontinental Championship match. Uh, this was followed by an ace video highlighting their rivalry, which was soundtracked by the kind of dramatic music you'd normally expect to find in a SmackDown video game, PS2, around the same time. Um, fantastic, as always. Love video packages like this. Absolutely brilliant. Uh, so we go on to the Intercontinental Championship now. It is Intercontinental Champion Rob Van Dam or RVD versus Brock Lesnar with Paul Heyman. Uh, Heyman? Paul Heyman. The card obviously continued to get better and better as we go towards the main event. RVD versus Lesnar was a really good match. Two clashes of styles. Brock Lesnar obviously being very quick, very young but very much a powerhouse versus Rob Van Dam, who was quick. He threw kicks, he threw uh, strikes and bounced off things. Uh, the champion uh, continually countered the challenger's brute strength and the crowd popped for every single thing. And I've often said this, in wrestling, a good crowd makes the wrestlers do better. Um, very much a believer in that because this past Saturday, I was on a show and the crowd was really good. Considering the heat, the crowd was really good uh, and they did everything they needed to do to make uh, myself and the other wrestlers perform um, and give a great show. And it's no different 20 years previous on main roster shows as well. Uh, like I say, very fine match. RVD would hit a five-star five star frog splash on Brock Lesnar after managing to take him down and uh, made the cover only for Paul Heyman to pull the referee, Charles Robinson, out of the ring and cause a disqualification. So RVD won the match, continues with the championship. And of course, the predictable ending of this match was that Lesnar would lose uh, and couldn't really lose, so he smashed RVD up a little bit inside the ring. Um, so, a lot of fun in this one. Really, really good. Um, Going to give this one three and a half cheap shots out of five. Uh, really enjoyable, this one, like I say. Definitely getting better. Winner by disqualification, Rob Van Dam. And not too much interference, of course, from the one Paul Heyman. Like I say, post-match. Uh, we got even more fun as Charles Robinson uh, began to rain down on uh, Heyman with the weakest-looking punches in wrestling history, only for Lesnar to pick him up and toss him aside like a rag doll. RVD then came careening off the top and took out the next big thing, only for Lesnar to recover and destroy the champion with an F5 onto a steel chair. Uh, next segment, we go back into the back. We get Bischoff and Stephanie McMahon staring each other down. Uh, forlorn Stephanie McMahon emerges from her office, uh, looking quite dejected. Uh, naturally, Bischoff jumped to conclusions and began gloating about her inability to sign Triple H. Uh, he signed, Steph says, wiping the smirk off the Royal GM's face before walking away. Uh, moments later, the game himself emerged and uh, was railroaded by Bischoff for making the wrong choice. Uh, that's when Hunter set him straight, informing the WCW head that the 
papers he had signed were actually his divorce papers and that he still hadn't decided which brand to work for. So yeah, this uh, has pleased Easy Eric to no end, of course, because he still hadn't lost Triple H's services. Going on to a no disqualification match now, it is the Big Show versus Booker T. Um, and uh, they've been feuding on and off since Booker T was kicked out of the now very much defunct New World Order, which is quite sad. Um, the no disqualification match was never going to be the best thing on the card, but it was surprisingly more enjoyable than anyone could have imagined. Uh, this, of course, was largely due to the uh, sweet spot where Booker T ran off the U.S. announce table and scissor kicked a big show through the Spanish announce table. You see, we don't get any table spots now with the announce tables because there's no Spanish announce table. And it's really sad. Really sad. Who's going to go through the table now? Anyway, uh, very short match. Didn't last very long um, and quite fun. Winner is Booker T. I'm going to give this one two and a half cheap shots out of five. Very middle of the road, quite enjoyable, but ultimately a bit too short as we go. Uh, meanwhile, over at the world, so it's now time for which WWF superstar or WWE superstar or diva is at the world in New York? Doesn't quite have the same thought process to it. I liked my old jingle. I'm very disappointed. But anyway, it's gone changed name from WWF New York to uh, the world. Uh, still the same setup and still in pay-per-views. They have a couple of superstars over there. This time it's Dory Wilson and Dor Marie who argue about who has the best bars. Um, brilliant. I think the award they were arguing over was the Golden Thong. Something like that. Um, I don't know. Anyway. anyway, move on. Time to play the game. It is the in-ring segment that took ages to finish, um, where Triple H came to the ring and they would be followed by the Raw general manager, Eric Bischoff, and the SmackDown general manager, Stephen McMahon. Uh, having to pitch the selling uh, to the game um, just when it looked like the game was about to side with Stephanie knowing saying that the better option was the devil that you know rather than the devil that you don't know Shawn Michaels hit the ring bearing in mind <laughs> we'd gone to one of the best matches in SummerSlam history just next month which you'll have to wait for for SummerSlam Anyway, um, so HBK reminded that uh, reminded us that while Hunter had been out with a major injury, it was Sean who had been promising to head to vengeance and bring his buddy home to the NWO before Big Kev had gotten hurt and Vince had dissolved the faction. Uh, with fans all chanting for D-Generation X, Michaels reminded Triple H how much fun they used to have together and that seemed to do the trick, promoting Hunter to announce that he was signing with Raw so that he and Triple H, uh, HBK rather, could make Bischoff's life a living hell. Of course, that wouldn't necessarily happen. Um, so reacting to Triple H backstage, we get some more interviews with Rikishi who expressed his disappointment about Triple H joining Raw because they couldn't run any more people over with a car. Uh, then Mark Lloyd, um, telling Mark Lloyd that it was a big loss, loss for the young guys on SmackDown who looked to the game as a leader. Across the way, Terry interrupted Booker and Goldust to get their thoughts, hilariously Goldust sheepishly covering his crotch when Terry walked in the room. He then stood by uh, a while and enlivened Booker, ranted about the time Shawn Michaels super kicked him out of the NWO. That's right, Booker, said Goldust. He may be the game, 
but we're the ones with the bigger joysticks. I'm going to ignore that quipped booker as Goldie left the room. This was, as you might expect, a very entertaining segment. They miss all these kind of segments. They really try nowadays, but they don't quite hit the mark. Uh, prior to the next match, we got a brief back uh, look back at the rivalry between Edge and Hulk Hogan, the current tag team champions, and Christian and Lance Storm. We move on to that match. There's WWE Tag Team Championship match. It is Tag Team Champions Edge and Hulk Hogan. Of course, the big story here was that Edge was at WrestleMania 6 in the crowd as Hulk Hogan faced the Ultimate Warrior in Canada. Hogan spent the first half of the match doing the work for his team, giving us the old school style match until getting beat down and eventually making the hot tag to Edge. It was at this point that the match really kicked up a notch and started getting exciting. A ref bump allowed Tess to run in and for his Canadian teammates. Well, that wasn't enough to give Landstorm and Christian the win. So Jericho had to get involved, interfering to help his fellow countrymen capture the tag team titles. Uh, it wasn't the best match on the card. Uh, it was very serviceable. Uh, tag team bout, but uh, yeah, the runnings perhaps a little too much. But the all winners and new tag team champions are the Un Americans, Lance Storm and Christian. Uh, very sort of entertaining match. Uh, a little too many runnings for me, though. So I'm going to give this a very middle of the road two and a half cheap shots out of five. We're going to move on now, and back in the back is Eric Bischoff trying to recruit Kurt Angle to Raw, but the Olympic gold medalist was far too focused on his match to think about that right now. Elsewhere, Mark Lloyd asked Stephanie McMahon about uh, Bischoff's heavy-handed recruitment tactics. Uh, Steph wasn't concerned about Bischoff telling Lloyd that she was in direct contact with every Raw superstar and would rip the heart out of the red brand. Uh, what does that mean? Asked Lawler. Are you going to smack down, JR? Nope, I'm a Raw guy. Besides, I'm not the heart of Raw, replied Ross. I may just be the butt. Uh, yeah, anyway. Um, moving on to the main event and the final match of the pay-per-view. It is the WWE Undisputed Champion. It is a triple threat match. The Undisputed Champion, Undertaker versus The Rock versus Kurt Angle. And you know that time and time again, these three will put on an excellent match. You can put them in a six-man Hell in a Cell match. You can put them in a tag team match. You can put them in a bra and panties match, and these guys would still make it entertaining. Triple threat matches being referred to as a classic and considered one of the best triple threat matches of all time. This one on Vengeance. And while I can confirm that it is, I can certainly say it was a damn good match. A really good match, uh, which, uh, though it started very slow, built up to a very fine crescendo towards the end. And uh, WWE tried and trusted formula of one guy napping on the outside while the other others work and uh, then ultimately switch. And the, the, the formula works anyway. Um, for the most part, all three world-class superstars worked their arses off in this one really really entertaining creating the drama um delivered a fine match of peaks there were valleys there was lots of drama and suspense and everything you'd want from a compelling match in a wrestling ring telling a fine story five minute finisher fest as well 
at the end, uh, shotgun finish. And though I, you know, that could be a cause for criticism. If it's done well, then it pops the crowd and that's exactly what you want. Um, 20 minutes, epic match. The Rock drove Kurt Angle into the mat and pinned him to become the undisputed champion after hitting people's elbows, rock bottoms, DDTs, you name it, it took a long time and the champion was not part of the finish. So ultimately, The Undertaker would for his title again soon. JR yelled about The Rock. Now, uh, that was the first seven time champion, the great one, posed for the fans. And, uh, you know, brilliant. Um, question, questioning really whether to have him pin Angle rather than The Undertaker, which uh, was such. A smart move thinking about it going forward because obviously the undertaker is really strong um I think it was the right decision thinking about it now um putting the actual champion does make it look stronger, but moving on to SummerSlam, it would make a brilliant story uh the rock wins, but the rock for crying out loud at this point in his game he simply didn't need any more kudos or credibility not true actually um thinking about it now i'm recording this a couple of days after i've watched the pay-per-view when i wrote this um not true at all um the rock played his part and he was the most sensible winner of this match going into SummerSlam against Brock Lesnar. Uh, obviously, the other two were very much heels. Not that that makes a lot of difference to heels, um, thinking about the psychology of it, they would beat each other up anyway. But uh, yeah, definitely the right move. And I'm going to give this four and a half cheap shots out of five. A damn fine match. Uh, a match for the ages, a match to watch. If you're looking for triple threat matches, it is really, really good. Um, you know, getting the dead man to legitimately be able to get back into the title picture now would be a bit more difficult. But I think ultimately, you know, Kurt Angle and the other take could perhaps beat each other up a little bit more and, and uh, you know, decide who was going to be the main part of the picture moving forward after SummerSlam. So we have the main event made for SummerSlam. Um, and uh, we move on to SummerSlam now uh, for the next match. Uh, next match, rather, the next pay-per-view uh, on, on August the 25th, 2002. Uh, it was the Nasu Veterans Memorial Coliseum in Uniondale, New York, that would be the host of this one. Anyway, uh, this was a pay-per-view that started off really slow with some really good matches to start with and built up to a fine ending to a great pay-per-view ultimately by the end. Um, really cool. And uh, yeah, with other wrestlers being in different feuds, it would ultimately make the SummerSlam pay-per-view very, very good. And the last remnants of WCW really have been killed off just a few short months after Survivor Series 2001, which is very, very much a shame. There's still plenty of WCW people in there, but um, nothing major now, which is a shame. Um, but yeah, really good pay-per-view. Um, can't can't fault it one bit, actually. Really, really good. Um, so if you've enjoyed the review of uh, Vengeance 2002, then please drop us a like. 
um, if you're watching this on YouTube. If you're watching, if you're listening to this as a podcast, very, very new thing that we're doing, uh, putting things as a podcast as well as putting them on YouTube, then thank you very much for listening because I'm just doing these as a fan. I'm not making any money on them. I'm just doing the thing. And, uh, you know, it's ultimately you guys and girls that listen and watch and uh, show us the appreciation that keeps us going. And occasionally I do appear on other things as well, um, including the Big Boss Book Club and uh, other things going forward. So, yeah, thank you very much for watching and or listening. And I'll see you next time for SummerSlam. Goodbye. Hiya.